Roald Dahl. What comes to mind when you first hear this name? Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the BFG, maybe some of the lesser known stories he wrote, like the witches or the twits. The twits needs to be made into an actual feature length film, by the way. Aside from being synonymous with children's literature, Roald Dahl also wrote some more dark and macabre stories, the tales of the unexpected, which in turn, were turned into an anthology series in the late 70s and early 80s. The tale I'll be looking at today was actually one of the numerous ones written by guest writers, and it was written by Elizabeth Taylor, and today I'm gonna to be looking at The Fly Paper. This is one that distinctly sticks out, maybe not for the right reasons. Whenever I think of this series, which I love, this is always one of the first ones I think of, so I'm gonna share it with you today. Hopefully you're gonna enjoy it. This is The Fly Paper. This episode starts with a piece to camera, as the earlier seasons did, with Roald Dahl himself, telling you a little bit about the story, how it made him feel, maybe about the guest writer, if it was a guest writer episode. So we've got Roald Dahl with the roaring fire next to him telling you about how he'd wished he'd written this one himself. It is quite a powerful one, if you've not seen it, you know, I'm going to put some warnings out there. It's got themes of stalking and potential child endangerment, shall I say? You don't really see anything graphic, but uh, I'm going to put that out there, because trigger warning. Watch it carefully. So the story begins with a police search in some marshlands in Northwood. I don't know if this is a fictitious place or not. Where Elaine Phillips, a 12-year-old girl, has been missing for five days. And you've got frogmen, you've got policemen with dogs searching the marshlands. Whilst in the background, you've got the audio of the news broadcast telling you this information. The hunt for Elaine Phillips, age 12, continues. Elaine has been missing from her home for five days now, and police today issued another appeal for any information that might help in the search for the Northwood schoolgirl. And flick to Sylvia who is the main character of this story. She's at a piano lesson, she's not enjoying it. She's got an inner monologue where she's having a bit of a, um, <laughs> well, she's, she tells you what she thinks as opposed to what she's telling other people. Rotten Beethoven. I hate it, I hate it. She's at a piano lesson, she's trying to play Fur Elise by Beethoven, and she's not doing a bad job to be fair. I can do as good a job as that. Sylvia, manages to in a monologue what the piano teacher says before she says it she's saying it's a waste of time and if you're not gonna be essentially she's saying it's a waste of time if you're not gonna put that much effort in and the piano teacher is actually played by sort of british tv royalty in a way stephanie cole who's been in a lot of sitcoms been a lot of older programs probably don't see her much now while sylvia's trying her best to play the piano and she's as i say she's doing a good job um the doorbell rings the piano teacher gets up oh, there's louise she's not only gifted but she's a proper pupil, in the words of the piano teacher. Proper pupil. Obviously, piano teacher's favourite rushes to the door. As she answers the door, Louise tells the piano teacher about a man who's been following her. Hello. I should hope not. What did he look like? Oh, dumb and hopeless, and sort of eager. Could it be the same man that the police are looking for that's been on the news? But she's also not sure if it is the exact same man on the news. But I would be a bit more worried that a girl of that age as being followed by a man, even in broad daylight, is quite worrying. And I would also be worried about sending Sylvia out, but not this piano teacher. Sylvia will let herself out. We must start, Louise. So Sylvia leaves the piano lesson, but not before we get to see this weird cut. Outside the house, Sylvia notices a man taking a bit of an interest in her. So she decides to walk the other way, which is a very good idea. I just want to say here, and I'll probably mention it again again at the end as well. Alfred Burke, who plays this stalker character, he does such a good job in this episode of coming across really creepy and slimy. He, he is the best actor in this episode. So going forward, Sylvia walks through the street and you see this guy following from a distance. Now you see this, you see this shot of her walking across a field. And the guy is not that far away and he is obviously stalking her at this point. There's a transition shot she manages to just get on a bus in time as it's arriving and they kind of flick back to the frogmen that are diving looking for this elaine phillips missing girl who's been missing for five days and it kind of it kind of gives the impression oh they found something just as she gets on the bus and she gets away and she get an expression from the stalker character which is um a bit odd to say the least the next shot we see sylvia arriving home but before she gets in the house her grandma who she lives with is talking to the vicar and through the conversation and the narrative and the exposition we find out that her parents died two years ago in a car crash and her grandma doesn't seem that happy about it but it wasn't as if she was there with them at the time of the crash thank god they had parked her on me you know so that they could go to greece 
the grandma talks to Sylvia, and this is a bit that I think is a bit nonchalant again, a bit like the piano teacher with the Louise. Sylvia tells her grandma the man's been following her. Grandma seems not that bothered about it. Never talk to strangers. That's a basic rule for girls of your age. Your supper's in the kitchen. Say goodnight. We see the grandma and we hear footsteps outside. We then cut to Sylvia sleeping, and this is quite a creepy scene. This whole thing is creepy. The Sylvia's asleep, and the man who was following her is now at her bedroom window. So he's found out where she lives, and he's literally looking in the window with a creepy smile. Cut to the next day, cut to Sylvia leaving school, and she gets on the bus. It's a double decker bus, she sat near the back. At the, on the ground level from what I can see this stairs going upstairs just at the last minute the guy who's been stalking her gets on the bus and sits opposite, opposite her they've got seats that are facing inwards to the bus and sits opposite her and her inner monologue she said she's sure that is the same guy who was stalking her and then he rather weirdly he starts talking to her as if he's known her a long time oh, nearly missed it I believe I've seen you before haven't I Wending your way either to or from a music lesson, I imagine. She's trying not to talk to him. She keeps her eyes closed. He then says he can relate to that. You want to shut the world out. <laughs> I used to do that when I was a child. Make myself invisible. Goodbye, nasty world. He's overly nice and it, it's creepy again. The conductor, the bus conductor comes along with the ticket. She doesn't want to say where she's getting off when she buys the ticket. So she says very quietly, The stop before Hamilton End. Where? Speak up, my darling. The stop before Hamilton End. What she said. Oh, I must be getting deaf. Full fair, same destination, please. So he knows where she's getting off the bus now, essentially. He asks Sylvia, How much your name? She gives him a fake name, and then he clocks the bag that she's got. Oh! Oh, then the music case is not your own. It bears the initials S.W. Primitive people often refuse to give their real names. Did you know that? Then she's a bit freaked out that she's dropped the ball on that one. And then he says, Sylvia Wilkinson. How do you know my name? And he's cocked it on her scarf. Then he starts to sing. And there's now we've, we've had a, a flick to her earlier slightly but we've got a woman near the front of the bus, an elderly sort of woman who doesn't really like the fact that he's singing loudly. I take it, madam, you do not appreciate my singing. No, I don't. Then he decides to move next to Sylvia. Then he says something really, really creepy. I'm very fond of children, you know. But of course, that's not allowed. Sylvia's thinking inside her head how to get away from this guy. She's gonna call the police. She's already thinking about how to describe him best to the police. And then she gets off and it's one stop before the stop she should have got off at. Not there yet, you know, it's one more stop to go. The elderly woman lets the man know what she thinks of him once again. I know your sort. She gets off the bus and it's sort of in the middle of nowhere in marshlands. And she approaches a telephone box, but it's been vandalized. She then turns around the guy's there again, the stalker, and asks her if she wants to borrow some money. At this point, the old lady sees, she comes over, tells him to get going, and then she asks Sylvia what's wrong. She says she doesn't live far from there. They go to the old woman's house. She's asking Sylvia if she's all right. She says, we've got to call the police when we get back to my house. Don't look back if the, if the man's following. They get to the woman's house. It looks like a static caravan, but it's got a nice garden and everything. And they put some cups out for tea and then she gets Sylvia to put some biscuits out and Sylvia she compliments Sylvia on putting the biscuits out oh how did you arrange those nicely <laughs> and she's trying to sort out the phone hello is that the police what wrong number you hear she's trying to get through and you hear that she's called the wrong number and then she passes a third cup and saucer to Sylvia then Sylvia sits down at the table and then you hear the door go hello properly Hello, Herbert. You're just in time. The tea's all ready. Oh, good. Eerily, Herbert, now, the stalker, tells Sylvia about the flypaper that's hanging in the window. 
and how the sweetness lures the flies in and then the stickiness traps them in a rather <laughs> eerie metaphor for what's happened to her. She then says she's got to go and gets up and both the woman and Herbert put their hands on each of her shoulders and say, you haven't finished your tea. Up to credits. It's an eerie episode. Alfred Burke, though, does a great job as the stalker. He's really creepy and his mannerisms and how he comes across. I think this is the kind of video they should show in schools to make children aware that, you know, don't go off with strangers even if they seem nice, like she did with the old woman who ended up being, um, knowing her that... And trapping the girl basically and that was the flypaper episode from tales of the unexpected if you liked it think of giving this video a like if you want to see more videos like this subscribe to the channel i'm going to be checking out some other shows and films that are a bit quirky or a bit mysterious and uh yeah i appreciate you watching i'll see you in the next video take it easy